I'm just going to give a talk that focuses on a poor man's approach to coarse graining, a kind of derivation of a non-equilibrium statistical modeling setup um, <coughs> with the sort of minimal machinery. And matter of fact, in some sense, the whole motivation for what I developed here was to circumvent the usual pathway, which we just saw described in the last lecture, through the famous Maurice Swansig projection operators, which then create generalized Langevin equations, which you hope then you can approximate by Markovian uh, dynamics. And I sort of wanted to cut that Gordian knot. And even if I obtained something that may be too crude, maybe doesn't apply at every case, uh, I wanted some sort of different conceptual framework. And so I'm going to give you that. Now, my talk is going to be first this sort of formalism in this sort of general setting. Uh, and then the second half is just one rather straightforward example uh, taken from statistical fluid dynamics, uh, thermalization of an energy spectrum in a Burgers of dynamics, um, which just illustrates it and makes it concrete. So I, it's a little dangerous to give all the abstract stuff to start with before you had a concrete example, but I hope that given the interest of time, that will work out. So uh, the overall procedure is as follows. I'm going to start from a completely deterministic underlying dynamics. So a high degree of freedom Hamiltonian system would be typical. Um, and I'm going to impose on that some kind of statistical model, a parametric model. And this is just going to be actually PDFs, single time PDFs on the phase space of the underlying dynamics. This can be thought of just a, a non-equilibrium ensembles on the uh, phase space determined by a certain number of chosen observables, which I'll call resolved variables or relevant uh, variables. Then <coughs> the question is, how do those things evolve in time? Uh, what we want to do is we want to quantify the lack of fit of any path among those ensembles, which I'll call trial density. Uh, <coughs> what is the intrinsic lack of fit to the underlying dynamics? And we can do that. Uh, by looking at the kullback leiblet or information or in relative entropy distance or divergence between how the true distribution should be propagated forward by the full dynamics as opposed to an, any kind of feasible propagation through this parametric family, which of course cannot fully represent the propagation of probability. So there will always be a deficit, there will always be an information loss, but we quantify that naturally in the usual relative entropy sense. And that then gives an objective function or a cost function or a loss function that can be minimized over paths. And one does that path minimization and arrives at um, some uh, equation for extremals. And those equations are the governing equations of the reduced model. They tell us how the means of the <coughs> uh, re resolved variables should evolve. And I'll show you actually what those equations look like they come out in a sort of theoretical form, very neatly using Hamilton-Jacobi theory. And one sees the thermodynamic structure of what you get. In practice, of course, it's not so easy to solve Hamilton-Jacobi equations. So you should usually resort to some kind of optimization to find extremal trajectories. And that can be done using these optical control algorithms. So that's the conceptual framework. And like I say, I, I address an audience who is obviously expert on all of the things I'm going to bypass no projection operators, absolutely no stochastic analysis. So uh, here's the um, <coughs> overall setting I think this audience knows perfectly well. We've got a high dimensional phase space, typical point Z sitting in gamma, and it's evolving by some deterministic dynamics, uh, complex dynamics. Let's assume it, it mimics exactly a Hamiltonian setup, so you have a divergence free vector field F and a uh, conserved en energy H. All right, so obviously then you have conservation of phase volume, you have conservation of the energy function on the uh, microscopic dynamics. And what you're interested in is taking some ensemble at time zero, say, propagating it forward under the dynamics. The phase flow is simply pushed forward by, excuse me, the probability density is simply pushed forward by the phase flow. Or equivalently, if you write this uh, infinitesimally in time, the uh, density, or better to say the log of the density, uh, satisfies the famous Liouville equation. And uh, you know, page one of any statistical mechanics book. And I'm writing this with a <coughs> an operator L here, which is, would be, for instance, like taking the Poisson bracket with the Hamiltonians. 
um, or here it's f dot the grad operator, uh, and that is uh, encoding the flux of the uh, probability. So this Liouville operator acts on uh, the true, <coughs> highly complex and intricate evolving probability density, uh, which is required to satisfy this equation. An essentially useless equation, because the level of complexity of the density is comparable to that of <coughs> the complexity of the, uh, you know, ergodic uh, or orbits of the uh, underlying dynamics. So what we do is then we say we're not going to follow that. We're going to simply impose some much lower dimensional model. So a parametric model, I recall, call it the NEQ for non-equilibrium model. It will again be a probability density all, all in phase space, the whole thing, but it's going to be parameterized by a few variables. I call them psi 1 through psi n. These are going to be the state variables in my reduced dynamics. Um, <coughs> this can be many things, and in fact, <coughs> perhaps very, very smart things like people are doing nowadays. Uh, but let me just take an old-fashioned choice. The most sort of natural canonical thing is to say that it would be given by uh, something which is Gibbs-like. So <coughs> with a summation convention over the index k, uh, we have, in, in, you know, in parallel to a Gibbsian distribution, some sort of distribution that depends now upon uh, <coughs> the observables, which I'll call A1 through AM, and these are just the coarse grain variables, the observables on the phase space that you decide to reduce in terms of. And of course, a big issue is how well you chose those things, and we'll say more about that. But given you, you have any sort of, f these are functions on the phase space, or random variables, and then dual to them are these uh, parameters, much like inverse temperatures or chemical potentials, <coughs> that participate in this ansatz, which defines the uh, probability measure, which attempts to follow imperfectly the uh, Liouville equation. Okay? So we have a vector of observables. I will actually slave the beta to the psi so as to conserve mean energy. Uh, so it, this is parameterized only by the psi's. And, um, of course, we're normalized by some uh, potential, which is like a free energy. Uh, and uh, let me make sure that I've got equilibrium within my class. So let's say when psi equals zero, equilibrium is uh, achieved. Okay? Non-equilibrium would mean what to you exactly? Non-equilibrium means that I have a statistical distribution that's not the equilibrium distribution. So statistical mechanism to, to secure have energy conservation? Yes, right? yes would be an initial condition that's far out of equilibrium, and I watch a relaxation back to equilibrium. That's all. So, so I'm at this, in this presentation, I'm not going to talk about driven systems and so on, but one could do some similar things. <coughs> As a matter of fact, it might even be a more convincing way to derive it, but I think this is the simplest way to explain it. <coughs> well, there's a justification for choosing that uh, uh, family. It's not the only family you wouldn't use, but the one that somehow seems natural is to take these exponential families that I just showed you. They, of course, represent the maximum of uh, <coughs> entropy uh, relative to phase volume uh, <coughs> at a given mean value of energy and a mean value of each one of the observables. And please remember this notation. So the mean with respect to this distribution rho uh, is written as the angle brackets, and uh, little a represents the mean of the random variable capital A for each k. And so what we have is the usual conjugacy. <coughs> the uh, parameters psi are just the Lagrange multipliers or the derivatives, the marginals of entropy with respect to the values of the mean uh, observables, a, k. So a conjugacy between the mean values and the, uh, <coughs> and the parameters through the convex function s. Now, of course, this idea is very old. and. Uh, People can say, well, that seems like a very reasonable choice of a guess for an ensemble if you had slow variables AK, and somehow you were able to identify all the slow variables, relegate the other variables to quick relaxation, and then you'd expect somehow to pass through that kind of a path of non-equilibrium uh, statistical states. But of course, I'm not pre uh, uh, precluding the possibility that you might built in memory into some of these variables, and so go beyond that. Um, <coughs> I'm being very, very uh, broad in terms of what these A's could be. They could be the memories of certain other variables that you want to uh, resolve. Okay. Excuse me. Oh, I yes. Yeah. It's not 
not yeah. a single standard. That's standard. correct. Well, it could be, yes. You could actually, as long as you can define it as, a phase ver uh, as an observable on the phase space, then it would be uh, reasonable. I mean, a double sign value. That's correct. So, um, and of course, this is an exponential family, and one knows uh, that uh, the uh, usual properties. So, there's the whole point. I have now this <coughs> desirable uh, set of trial probability densities on phase space. I submit them to the Liouville operator to check how well they're actually respecting the underlying dynamics. And of course, I don't get zero anymore. I get some residual. I call it R. Now, for these canonical ones that I just wrote down, uh, the residual takes a nice form. Remember, the beta was slave to the psi's. So I, I get a first term that depends upon the time derivative of these psi's. I imagine a path, a feasible path of these psi's. So they have the time derivative of psi dot against the projection. This is the uh, orthogonal projection uh, to the projection onto the energy uh, <coughs> shell. The, um, the, uh, with respect to that instantaneous non-equilibrium measure uh, of this uh, score variable or this uh, <coughs> deviation between the observable and its mean. And then I get a contribution which comes from the actual dynamics. got the L in it. That's the uh, <coughs> Liouville operator applied to the, uh, to the observables. And of course, the key point is that this part sits within the span of the resolved variables, whereas this part generates components that are outside of that span or orthogonal to that span. And that's, of course, what's generating dissipation in the world. And this is where Maurice Wonsig projects and so forth and so on. <coughs> but at any rate, this is my resolved uh, excuse me, by residual. It has a couple of nice properties. It's basically a kind of dynamical analog to what the statistician calls a score variable for a parametric statistical model. It's a zero uh, mean, and it, in this case, it's set up to be orthogonal to the energy function uh, <coughs> or uncorrelated with the energy. That's uh, because we slave the beta, just to be clean. And then I define my lack of fit as simply mean square of that. So the mean square with respect to the observable at that moment. Uh, but I, now I want to tell you why that very reasonable choice is, uh, in some sense, the intrinsic choice. First of all, suppose you take any observable whatsoever, time independent, say, and you look at its non-equilibrium mean. So this means its expectation with respect to this evolving path of feasible uh, <coughs> non-equilibrium states. Then you obtain, first of all, a standard term, which is the uh, <coughs> expectation of the Liouville operator acting on the uh, observable. And then you obtain this residual term, which is the covariance between the observable and this uh, Liouville residual. And this is, in fact, going to be the term which gives us dissipation. So we're starting with a completely conservative dynamics, but we're going to have a dissipative mean dynamics on the resolved variable. And <coughs> the dissipation is going to come exactly from this residual term. Okay. For instance, if you were to do the naive moment closure and just say, I have a set of observables, A1 through AM. So I'll put A1 through AM is and my Bs. Then I have M equations and I have M unknowns, psi 1 through psi M. I'll close the system by simply saying that this equation, which would be true for the exact propagation of probability, is now true for the trial propagation. That's Galerkin projection of the Liouville equation then this would be simply take to be exactly zero. And what you obtain is a completely dissipationless dynamics. And you refuse to acknowledge that you're not resolving everything. So it's very key that you bring this term in. Okay, so that's the first point. The second point is that it has acute information theoretic interpretation. So I think everybody in this audience knows this formula, <laughs> what the kullback leibler in the distance is between an exact and a model. And so I do something like truncation error in a numerical method. Suppose at a moment of time, I was actually at a perfect uh, resolution. So I, I'm at a point at time t, psi of t. I have a certain non-equilibrium trial density at that time. Suppose I propagate it forward under the true dynamics. This is a full <coughs> simulation under the true dynamics of the uh, Liouville equation. And I compare that to just somehow evolving the parameters of the model 
in some way, along some feasible path, psi. Okay? So that I'm comparing my model to the truth for a short interval of time, delta t. If we expand that for an Taylor series in delta t, the leading order term is nothing other than this mean square of the Liouville residual. This is precisely the same as the way Fisher information is derived from relative entropy in a parametric model, except this ties it to the dynamics of the model path psi. So this thing L, which I just defined on the previous slide, <coughs> is precisely the information rate loss due to modeling the dynamics rather than doing the full distribution. Okay? So therefore I like it. <laughs> and I take it as my criterion. I don't have any theorem, I just like it. It seems like the right thing to minimize. It's a mean square, it has all the information meaning. So I take a path. In this case, I'm only going to model relaxation to equilibrium is a simple problem. So I start a system out of equilibrium, put too much energy somewhere, and it's not an equipartition. I want to watch the energies flow back to equilibrium or equipartition. So I have an initial stake, psi zero, which is out of equilibrium. And I want to watch a path of these trial densities evolve towards equilibrium, which is psi equals zero over a time horizon from zero to infinity, and I'll just minimize over all possible paths this lack of fit or this information loss rate L, okay? And that then becomes a classic problem just in calculus of variations or minimum action or whatever you want to call it, uh, where now my Lagrangian, however, is a little different. It's not like what you see when you have a harmonic oscillator where there's a difference of two terms. <coughs> this is a contribution coming from the resolved and unresolved parts it's a positive definite, a problem, it's generally, it's jointly convexing psi and psi dot. Okay, so we're actually going to find, yes? Why is there no psi token problem? Oh, because uh, it's the, resol the resolvent, uh, excuse me, the residual is, uh, the residual is con created by taking first derivatives of the log likelihood. So it creates, by the chain rule, psi dot. Well, no, because whenever you have a, <coughs> a Lagrangian which involves first order differential, uh, di differentials, then of course the Euler Lagrange equations are second order, right? Right? But the observ but the, uh, but the uh, Lagrangian itself only depends upon the first derivative. But so underlying the dynamics of fitting was first order dynamics. That's right. Yeah. 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 If you take an arbitrary variable, it, can, it would not satisfy even a third order differential equation. It could be very non-autonomous if you just take ran I mean random, I mean arbitrary variable psi. There is no a priori reason why there should be an autonomy in their dynamics. I, I, you're jumping ahead to what the sort of, well, okay, let, I don't know. <laughs> so. Uh, Anyways, this is something that is jointly convex, and so you don't worry about Jacobi points and so forth, and the fact that extremals are not minima. This is going to be minima. And uh, of course, this is now a peculiar thing. Remember, this was a, <coughs> this was an, a relative entry divided by t, delta t squared. So its integral in time has the units of information loss rate or entropy production. So this action has the units of entropy production. It is being minimized then, or the information loss rate is being minimized over the uh, optimal path. Okay? Of course, you do get order Lagrange equations. That is to say, the prediction of the problem requires solving a two point boundary value problem with a specified non equilibrium initial state and an equilibrium terminal state, and in principle, second order differential equations there. But I'm not going to look at it that way. I'm going to take sort of a more of a pr an approach through optimal control theory. Obviously, all such problems are special cases of optimal control. Um, and the algorithms for optimal control are the ones one wants to implement. So at this point, I certainly have a principle. And I could then try to solve this and check this uh, to see does this work. But I want to give you a couple more slides first just to show you what these governing equations really look like. Okay, So there's a little more theory. I'm going to apply, instead of looking directly at the Euler-Lagrange equations, look at the Hamilton-Jacobi theory. This is perfect for this problem. So when you have a Lagrangian, you can transform to its conjugate momenta. 
So the psi's are like positions and the pi's are like momenta. It's going to turn out that the psi's are like thermodynamic forces and the pi's are like thermodynamic fluxes. That's exactly what's going to happen. But for now, we just think of this as an analogy to maybe mechanics or calculus of variation. What is the derivative of this lack of fit Lagrangian, this mean square Liouville residual with respect to psi dot? It is precisely the covariance between the residual and the resolved variable corresponding to psi k. That's a k. And if you remember from the moment equation, it's precisely the, the, the deficit in the moment equation due to irreversibility, due to dissipation. So <coughs> These are going to be in what I call the irreversible fluxes. If you then write the Legendre transform of the Lagrangian, which is quadratic in the psi dot, so you can easily work it out explicitly, that's this dot, 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 uh, you get a Hamiltonian function, okay? One more thing, you do what you always do in optimizations, you create the value function. In this case, I'm looking at just relaxation from time zero to infinity, so it's a stationary situation. It's a function just of the initial state. So it's the minimum action or minimum uh, <coughs> lo information loss rate from any given initial state. And that is then some function on this uh, parameter space of the reduced model. That's what I call V for value function. And what's known, of course, is that the value function or the minimum action satisfies the Hamilton-Jacobi equation. So you substitute in pi is equal to minus the gradient of V to pi in the Hamilton-Jacobi equation, and it equals zero. This is a stationary case because I'm just looking at this relaxation to equilibrium as the simplest case. Now we can eliminate pi here. We can substitute dv by d psi for pi here, and I have a closed equation which tells me the propagation of the observables. This is a computable quantity since I know what my operator is. <laughs> and I know what my V is, and there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between the size and the mean A's, if you recall. That was the, uh, uh, going back to that uh, entropy function. That's so <coughs> the equation's in motion close, and the closure is basically that you have a gradient flow <coughs> in, this, uh, in this term. <coughs> now, in fact, what you have derived, it turned out, I didn't realize this till after <laughs> I did it, <laughs> is you've derived a set of equations that people in non-equilibrium thermodynamics use and uh, have sort of derived as kind of the generic structure that seems to come up all the time. And uh, <coughs> so it turns out that with a little more work that I won't show you, this term here can be written as a Hamiltonian flow. It's a Hamiltonian flow in the space of mean values of A. And <coughs> so this J here is an anti-symmetric matrix. This is, of course, a gradient flow. So Morrison called this metroplectic because we have a symplectic part and a gradient part. Or uh, the people who made a big deal out about this call it the generic equations because you have a part here which is reversible and, and a part here which defines the dissipation or the irreversible part of the uh, dynamics. So uh, maybe I can say one more thing about that. Um, in particular, if you were to go back to that function s, which defined the duality between the parameters psi and the mean values a, that is the entropy of the non-equilibrium state, <coughs> then uh, look at its time derivative along any extremal. It's straightforward to evaluate it. It's just a certain uh, dot product between psi and it's the gradient of v. And <coughs> it is always greater than v just by convexity of v. And uh, in fact, as you approach uh, near equilibrium, it becomes equal to 2v. So this entropy reduction is exactly the value function v, the information loss rate. Um, similarly, you can get classical textbook linear thermodynamics out. And uh, if you're near equilibrium, then the whole problem collapses because the Lagrangian becomes quadratic jointly in psi and psi dot. You have a quadratic programming problem. <coughs> the value function is a quadratic form. Its, its gradient is a linear form that takes the psi's to the pi's, because you remember that was the gradient. Uh, and this is nothing other than the transport coefficient or the transport matrix between thermodynamic forces and thermodynamic fluxes. But now that is not just something that's posited 
and then required to be positive definite so that this is true and required to be symmetric so that Ansaga reciprocity is true, this thing is the solution of a Riccati matrix equation. Hamilton-Jacobi equation becomes a Riccati matrix equation when you have just quadratic uh, objective function. And so this equation, you have a source term here. This is a kind of term you see almost from the Maurice Wonsig formalism. It represents what the unresolved component of the Liouville operator on the resolved variables is. This thing drives <laughs> this uh, equation. It's like a right-hand side. And the matrix M satisfies this equation. And the full matrix is determined from the optimization principle. So that's, I don't know, do I have any time left? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Excuse me? Another ten minutes. Ten minutes, okay. Questions. Right, okay. Well, I'll try to do this quick. Um, that's a lot of general stuff. I, I want it, it's better to have a concrete example, and here's a simple one that's still interesting enough. Um, <coughs> uh, I always thought it was a strange problem, but now I've been convinced it's a good test case. You take the Invisitberger's equation. This is just a toy hydrodynamics in one dimension, periodic in space, say. <coughs> and you just Galerian can project it onto a finite number of modes, n. No dissipation, no forcing, nothing. Just an inviscid equation projected onto a finite number of modes. Like it's going to give you a Hamiltonian system. And it's a Hamiltonian system in the complex Fourier amplitude zk of the uh, velocity function here of x and t. And so it has a typical quadratic nonlinearity of hydrodynamics. Okay? Now, that actually has two invariants. I'm going to suppress one of them. <coughs> The interesting invariant is just the total energy is the sum of squares of these things. And uh, <coughs> of course, therefore, you can write down a Gibbs distribution, which is a completely trivial thing. You just have equipartition of energy across all the Fourier modes. And they're independent Gaussians. So it's very simple uh, equilibrium statistical mechanics. Now, you might say this is a very artificial problem. I, I don't think Burgers does something like that. In fact, <coughs> what Burgers does is when you truncate it at a finite wave number, <coughs> as you know, Berger steepens waves. The waves come to that highest wave number, and they, <coughs> they sort of bounce off the highest wave number, and energy, <coughs> uh, turbulent energy, is generated in the high modes. Uh, and so what you end up with after some time, even if you start from a smooth initial condition, is a field that looks like it's equipartitioned in the high Fourier modes, but still out of equilibrium in the low Fourier modes. And so gradually, this energy spectrum will thermalize, okay? So the question is, can we use this as a test case? And can we get anything decent in terms of the rates at which the different modes thermalize? So here's a picture of what happens. <coughs> you start with some sort of profile that you know is going to shock. It, of course, has a very uh, <coughs> uh, rapidly decreasing energy spectrum. Uh, but you let that go, the shock develops, but it can't be dissipated, there's no dissipation. It can't get past the highest wave truncation. Energy is conserved within n modes. And so it starts to develop a, a something that looks like a heat bath by itself. There's no coupling to a bath. This is doing it itself. And it's self-thermalizing. And yet the low modes at this later time are still out of equilibrium. And then, it, as it were, the boundary between the <coughs> equilibrium part and the out of equilibrium part slowly moves until the system is fully thermalized. Okay, so that is a quote toy problem from sort of I hate to use the word but turbulence modeling maybe uh, <laughs> or statistical fluid dynamics. Let's say that. So I write it down because I wanted to show you that you can actually write this theory that I gave you down in this specific case. Now I'm going to take an absurdly simplified set of trial densities. <coughs> uh, I have to tell you, my postdoc who worked with me sort of never forgave me for <laughs> publishing such a simplified thing. But um, we're just going to say, look, the equilibrium spectrum is just independent Fourier modes Gaussian. So let's just take independent Fourier modes Gaussian, but with <coughs> variances, that is say energy spectrum, that's not uniform. It's not equipartition. This is too simple. It can't work for everything, but let's see how we go with that. 
Okay, for starters. Maybe it's reasonable when you're not too far away from the equilibrium, whatever. Certainly it's not a fancy thing, and I haven't built in memory to these. Uh, I haven't done anything fancy. This is in some sense the simplest or least intelligent um, <coughs> uh, set of trial densities. So if I stick such a simple ansatz into the whole machinery that I gave you, then I can actually calculate this Lagrange. In other words, I can compute the mean square of the Liouville residual on this space given any path uh, you know, of the energy spectrum, which is just one over the value of these parameters. They're like inverse temperatures for each mode. So <laughs> there it is. You can calculate it. You have something that looks like a kinetic energy term with some masses that depend sort of upon the state itself. And then you have this complicated potential energy term. Notice it comes with a plus sign. Um, I'll still call it potential energy. And of course, when you're in equipartition and all these three are equal, then this thing vanishes because it's a, a sum over the interacting wave modes <coughs> due to the nonlinearity of the um, Berger's dynamic. So uh, you get this somewhat complicated looking um, uh, potential energy. Uh, and notice that there is nothing here. There is no fit constant. There's no t uh, parameter to be tuned to data, nothing. Uh, that's just putting in any kind of energy spectrum, which is just trivially uncorrelated, uh, into this, uh, shall we say, Liouville equation, computing its residual, computing its information rate loss, and there is the function that it is for any path psi. Okay? Now, I probably ran out of time to tell you this, so let me just lie. The actual simulations kind of show are slightly more difficult than the stationary closure that I showed you before, because it turns out that we're going to start are simulations from a, a state which is exactly one of these states. It's going to have lots of energy in the low modes and less in the high modes, and we're going to watch the energy flux out. But at time zero, the, there's going to be a no disparity between the model and the initial condition. And so in that case, you need to do a non-stationary non version or an envelope version of what I just did because you know something more at time zero than that stationary version says. <laughs> you know that you're actually at the, but let me uh, just avoid that because I think I'll run out of time. Okay, <coughs> here's the one thing you can do that's block of the envelope. Suppose you just say, I can't solve that. You have to hit it hard, hard with a numerical method to minimize that complicated Lagrangian. But what I could do is I could say the following. Put all of the modes except one specified mode, number k, into equilibrium and uh, just displace one and pretend that your model is that you're watching the evolution of one, assuming all the others are being essentially constant. Then, of course, the whole problem reduces to a problem in one variable, and that I can solve. That's back of the envelope. That can be solved analytically. And if I do so <coughs> and do that stuff that I showed you, I obtain a simple first order ODE, which is just a relaxation equation for the difference between beta, the equipartition value, and the a non-equilibrium value of psi k. So that thing over here, put a minus sign. It's that value is equal to some coefficient. The coefficient has in it a time scale, of course. And I can write down what the time scale is. It depends inversely on the wave mode. So the high modes are relaxing faster than the low modes. And it also has a little bit of nonlinearity in it here. So this is not just near equilibrium linear response. Uh, it can be applied in principle. I don't know if it's going to be good because of my ansatz is so simple, but it could be applied farther from equilibrium and you still have a nonlinear dynamics. So uh, the optimal closure then in this back of the envelope calculation where I just freeze all but one tells me what the time scaling should be and it even tells me what the profile should be. I can solve this differential equation for the appropriate profile in time. And uh, I'm interested in all of those things. And so here's a simulation. These simulation results are not done by the back of the envelope. They're done by solving the full system with an optimal control algorithm, okay? So these are the actual extremals of that Lagrangian. Um, <coughs> so what you do is you take one of the modes. <coughs> I take either mode one, two, four, uh, out of 512 in the system. I double the energy in that one mode, leave everything else the same, and I just let it relax back. And <coughs> if I plot it in this rescaled time, which remember I had that back of the envelope time scale, I get <coughs> all the uh, 
you know, a pretty good fit there for the um, profiles in time, okay? And you'll notice it's not a simple exponential decay. It's uh, because of that envelope thing I told you, but uh, that's a little more complicated. Of course, my postdoc, since he hated my ansatz so much, wanted to break the system. And of course, all you have to do is take the uh, disturbance large enough that that uh, simple quasi-equilibrium ansatz is not going to be good enough. So you take a single mode and you do eight times the uh, energy, and just in that one mode, eight times the equipartition energy. And <coughs> here you get that these circles are the, the model, and these uh, triangles and this curve is the theory. So you don't have a perfect agreement, certainly. <coughs> OK? But anyways, you can go on. One more slide, and I'll be done on this. <coughs> You can just play the same game now. Let me take the lowest 15 modes and double all their energies. And then <coughs> have the energies of the uh, remaining modes out to 512, essentially, in the equipartition value. Um, <coughs> uh, you could argue that this is still somewhat near to equilibrium, since there are preponderantly more modes in equilibrium than out. But there is still a substantial energy flow out of this little block of modes that has twice as much energy that has to flux into equipartition. And so <coughs> we then calculate, um, <coughs> compare full uh, DNS on ensembles, 20,000 samples average and so forth, of this system versus the theoretical prediction just gotten by optimal paths. And here are the first 15 modes, again, rescaled by this uh, typical time scaling, so they fall on the same plot. So in fact, they follow that back of the envelope pretty darn well. I will not show you, of course, if I take all 15 modes and go eight times. <laughs> because it's, it's not, it, 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 it's a bit of a bad, bad result. Well, you yeah, yeah. have to shift the energy in both directions. Well, yes. I mean, so we are actually, <coughs> we're shifting the energy in the other modes to keep it at a fixed amount. Yeah, it's it's some, of the pro the some of the profiles, some of the profiles are not even monotonic. They're kind of wild. You know, it's not good. It's not good. And the reason is that the it's not so much the fitting because we've done everything. We've run the whole optimization on this. That was the point. But the trial density, the ansatz that you apply, is very simplistic. So obviously, for that, you'd have to apply a much smarter uh, trial density, and it's going to be a, a lot of work. So that's my end. I'll just sort of summarize this as kind of the philosophy of it. Um, it's what I call optimal closure. Uh, it's appropriate to systems where you have a lot of confidence in the underlying deterministic dynamics, but you want to reduce it to many fewer variables with a statistical model. Um, you have what I think is an intrinsic criterion. I don't have a theorem that says this is the one and only thing you should ever minimize, but that's what I do. As a matter of fact, if you look at my old paper, I didn't even believe myself. I, I put empirical weights into this thing and tried to adjust them, only to discover that when I did examples, all the weights were one. So this seems to be the intrinsic uh, quantity, this kullback leibler uh, divergence. And um, <coughs> you do have a natural thermodynamic structure coming out. You do, you know, you can identify the different quantities that this theory spits out as, as, as transport coefficients or response kernels if you do force systems, which I haven't talked about. Um, and you can run past linear response. I mean, you can get beyond linear response, uh, which uh, is important. And furthermore, th the theory is predictive. I mean, traditional linear response in the statistical mechanics books writes down, or fluctuation dissipation, writes down the non-equilibrium averages as following the autocorrelation of, of equilibrium fluctuations. But those things have to be computed. Here, for instance, in this Burgers thing, I did not compute a single time step of the underlying dynamics at all, right? So um, it's a more predictive, as it were. And then, of course, the thing is, what I'm working on now is it's not good enough unless what you put in is good. And so we cannot continue to put in relatively stupid trial densities like I did to the burgers for simplicity, shall we say. You really need to include some sort of memory or use that. And that, of course, will require that you do some simulations to determine these memory variables or some sort of selected uh, autocorrelation information into the observables. And then, of course, I should really get into the 21st century and use some very smart <laughs> parameterizations of these densities with machine learning or something, but someone can tell me how to do that. Okay. <coughs>